Thank you, Alessandro. Thank you all for coming here. Um, it is a pleasure for me to um, introduce you to this topic of human rights. I do hope it's going to be a pleasure for you as well. Um, and uh, I would like again to thank Alessandro for uh, everything he does for me while I'm in Brazil, which, believe me, is not limited to academic partnership. Uh, and uh, also to all my colleagues here uh, that um, honor me of uh, their attention for my work. Uh, Alessandro was mentioning the workshop on my book that took place um, at the end of January, the first time I came here this year. Um, and uh, I am also happy to be part of the project that uh, Alessandro was mentioning that is called Count in South America. Uh, and uh, as Alessandro mentioned, uh, includes four European universities and four Southern American universities, two Brazilians and two Argentinians. Um, so ahead of us, in the next four years, we'll have a lot of exchange. Um, I'll be done soon with the first exchange of this project that happens here in uh, Florianopolis. But you will have other uh, scholars from uh, four different European universities, London School of Economics, Halle uh, Universität, uh, Martin Luther uh, Universität, uh, Halle Wittenberg, to be precise, and the University of Lisbon, besides other colleagues from the University of Catania. So make the most of them, uh, stress them, exploit them as much as possible. They have to work. Uh, at least as much as Alessandro has me worked here. <laughs> um, okay, so many apologies for my inability to speak to you in Portuguese. I am ashamed not to be able to speak Portuguese in, to begin with because I like very much the language and it's not that difficult from an Italian, it's not that easy either, but uh, it's not very difficult. In fact, after couple of weeks I already realized that I understand 70% of what you say but I'm not able to speak yet. I don't want to promise that, that I will because I've already promised that to myself and to others and I haven't been able to, you know, keep my promises. So I won't say anything but rest assured that deep in my heart there is the strong motivation and uh, steady intention to fill this gap. So apologies for my English, as Alessandro said, you may try to ask in Portuguese, uh, especially philosophical Portuguese, I'm, I'm pretty confident to be able to understand. Okay, so let's start this uh, course on uh, human rights, or to be more precise, on the philosophy of human rights. There are many different angles uh, from which uh, you can uh, talk. Uh, study, reflect on uh, human rights, uh, the angle that I'm going to take uh, is that of a philosophical reflection on, on human rights. And in particular, I should say, among the many philosophical questions that you may have about human rights, uh, what is the nature of human rights, what rights count as human rights, what whether they are moral or political norms, or both moral and political norms, uh, there is one question that this whole course will be mainly focused on, and this is the question which I think is the uh, classical question uh, you may have, uh, is the question of the justification of human rights. And by justification of human rights, I mean what is the ground the philosophical ground, if there is any, um, for the normativity that we usually attach to human rights. To put it in very simple terms, the question I am interested in is why uh, human rights are supposed to have any obligatory force on us. Why do we take them seriously and we believe, uh, if we do, that uh, the normativity that they come with is uh, grounded in something, and I want to focus on this something 
and look for uh, a philosophical justification or foundation. Now, before I move to that specific philosophical question, about which I'm going to give you just an introduction today, and in the upcoming lectures I will present some uh, detailed account uh, on the foundation of human rights. But before I move to that question of the foundation of uh, the normativity of human rights, I thought it would be useful, at least for some of you, apologies if you are already rather familiar with this subject, but um, to be prudent, I assume that at least some of you uh, for the first time approach at least the subject of human rights from a philosophical perspective. I thought that I would use uh, James Nigel's uh, account of human rights in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy as a general introduction to the topic. Um, what I'm going to say, uh, you will, most of it at least, you will find it online, it's fully accessible if you look for the uh, entry human rights in the uh, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, so what I'm going to say in the next 20 minutes is not very original uh, and doesn't come from directly from my mind, so it might be the best part of the course, so be careful not to miss this one. Okay, so uh, why am I using James Nigel? Let me say at least this. Um, well, because he is the founding father of the philosophy of human rights. He is the only the first one, at least, that already in the 70s started uh, a systematic study of human rights when human rights were not a topic in academia. I mean, there were no courses on human rights like the one we are having today, like you find now everywhere in every <coughs> um, law department, philosophy department, political science department around the world. So one of the great merit of James Nigel uh, he, is that uh, he uh, started this subfield of philosophy, political philosophy, uh, and um, there are certain things I'm going to criticize uh, later on, even today, about this account. But as a general introduction, he uh, I think is the best guidance for us. Okay, so. What are human rights? I mean, the f it's important to have the basic features uh, firm and uh, clear. Uh, human rights are international norms uh, that help to protect people uh, everywhere in the world from <coughs> severe political, legal, and social abuses. Notice in this provisional definition I'm giving you, there are certain features that we will be discussing and that you should focus on, you should pay attention to. So these are international norms, not national norms, uh, that help to protect people, that is individuals, from severe abuses. So we are, we are already committing ourselves to saying that human rights are not about perhaps significant but not most significant things, so they don't protect us from uh, um, failures that do not impact into our uh, well-being. Uh, they uh, cannot be considered only moral uh, norms uh, and there must be a certain degree of international recognition of these norms. So, human rights exist in both in morality and in law at the national and international levels, but they are primarily addressed towards governments. So, when there is a human right abuse, this is the idea, the first addressee of the complaint is not an individual person, it's a government. So, um, I mean, this claim is itself disputable, but uh, I think that there is a widespread agreement on the fact that uh, the 
potential violators of human rights are not individual persons, individuals, but are public officials representative of governments. So, if, just to jump a little bit ahead, if you exit from this room and you no longer find your car because it was stolen by a private individual, nobody would say that this is a violation of your human rights to private property. But if your car was uh, confiscated by the police for the reason that you are a political opponent to this government, and that's an act of uh, you know, uh, aggression against you because of your political opinion, that same act, always your car being taken away, counts as a human right violation. So in this sense, the first addressees of uh, human rights are governments, not individuals. Now, some people believe that there are certain actions done by individuals that also should count as human rights uh, violations. So imagine a violent husband uh, that beats his wife. Now, um, as it is, that kind of crime, private violence, is not a human rights violation of the woman who is the victim, but to the extent in which the government fails to do whatever is in its power to prevent these acts, for example, by failing to uh, make a, a campaign for educating people to have better uh, family relations, violent free family relations, if the government fails to take initiatives to prevent acts of um, private violence, then that action that was not committed by a public official but by an individual, private individual, may itself count as a human rights violation. Okay? Um, so, uh, prima facie, I am inv inviting you to think of human rights as norms that are uh, directed towards governments. It doesn't mean, though, that the only possible violators of human rights are directly public officials, because there may be an omission, uh, not to mention a, a sort of encouragement uh, in the government to, uh, done by the government to um, uh, that make the violation of human rights uh, possible by private individuals. Okay. Uh, obviously, the main sources, the main source of human rights is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, that was uh, approved by the General Assembly of the United Nations in 1948. And uh, after that, as you know. Uh, there are many uh, human rights documents and treaties, most importantly, the two treaties uh, uh, from, 19, from yes, 1966, the treaties on civic and political rights, incidentally signed by the Western world, uh, massively by the Western world, but not signed by the then communist bloc. And the treaty uh, on social economic rights, obviously, massively signed by the communist bloc in the 60s and not signed by at least some of the Western countries. Uh, in addition to these treaties, I mean, we might uh, mention also uh, the documents that were produced by the Council of Europe, uh, the Organization of American States, the African Union, and so on and so forth, in addition to the specific conventions, the Human Rights Convention against uh, discrimination, against genocide, against women uh, discrimination, and so on and so forth. So there are many documents that constitute the juridical source uh, of uh, 
the human rights as we know them today. And, I, and, I, and as I was mentioning, the philosophy of human rights addresses questions that concern the existence of human rights, so uh, what rights should count as human rights, so should uh, uh, a prohibition to tell lies to your uh, partners count uh, as a human right issue or not, should uh, the fact that your cards is stolen too frequently in your city uh, be considered as a human right violation or not? Um, should your lack uh, of uh, opportunity to receive public education be considered as a human right violation or not? Uh, uh, should the uh, limitation of political rights uh, in the sense that you are not allowed to participate at least on equal footing uh, in the selection of your representatives uh, be considered as a human rights violation. You might think, of course, that's a human rights violation. Many people think it's not, and we will see why. And so on and so forth. So that's the question about the existence of human rights. What rights should we consider as part of this list I mean, we already have a list, many lists of human rights, but the philosophy of human rights asks whether these lists are too short, too long, whether we should get rid of some of the rights that are already included, whether we should include other rights that are not there. For example, the, here, the typical example is the wonderful, I think it's Article 24 of the Universal Declaration of rights that recognize to each and every human being a human right to holiday with pay. So there is a human right in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, not in some minor documents down there, that says that there is a human right for each and every individual to have a job and also to have vacation paid by your employer. Uh, um, from that job. Many take that as an example of uh, an inflation of human rights. Remember, human rights are supposed to uh, protect you from severe uh, abuses. Now, there is an interesting article written by a Columbia lawyer that tries to show that you're, if you work and you are never allowed to go on vacation, uh, without paying, your life is pretty miserable. So he takes very seriously this idea that without holiday with pay, your life is going to uh, be pretty bad and therefore it's okay to have a human right that protects you from that kind of abuse. But in most of the people intuitively think that uh, a guarantee to have vacation with pay should not be part of a list of human rights because it's not serious enough. It's something intuitively very different from being protected from torture, from genocide, from ethnic cleansing, from um, breach of your physical integrities and so integrity and so on and so forth. So the question of the existence is really the question about whether certain things should be included or not included in the list of human rights. Then there is the question of, well, related to the question of the existence, there is the question of content. Uh, I mean, uh, what areas of human li life should be protected by human rights? Only civil and political rights, only social economic rights, a combination of the two, only minimal protections against uh, abuses that put in danger your physical integrity, so basically you know, your life, your health, um, or a combination of all these things. And there is the question about the nature of human rights. Are human rights moral rights uh, that are then translated into political norms? into 
norms of international law uh, is a moral underpinning of these rights a necessary component or it's something that may be there but it's not a necessary condition for having human rights so there may be uh, yeah again I mean think of the example of the human right to holiday with pay it's very hard to say that there is a moral correlate of that uh, uh, in political right in uh, part of the international law uh, and yet we say that there is uh, this human right so the question about the nature is really the question about what kind of rights are human rights um, and you know the two main candidates are moral rights, rights that we find in widespread moralities, political rights, rights that have not necessarily a connection with moral rights, or a combination of the two, that is, some political rights are have an immoral correlate, some don't. Um, and then, of course, there is the question of justification of human rights. Independently of what we think or what the list of human rights should look like, independently, up to a point, independently of the question of whether we think that human rights are moral or political norms, there is the question of what grounds the normativity of human rights. So why should they be things we take seriously, things that influence our behavior, things that we use to assess the legitimacy of states uh, up to a point that in case in which certain human rights are violated, we might think there is a right by the international community to interfere in the internal affairs of the country and by interference, you may think kind of uh, range of possibilities moving from the softest form of interference that is moral condemnation by the international community. So imagine the general secretary of the United Nations that say uh, the condition of prisons in Italy is not acceptable because there is a human right to uh, a punishment that are not cruel or degrading, in fact there is, uh, and uh, Italy is not living up to the standards of these human rights. So, as a general secretary of the, of the United Nations, I make this public uh, uh, affirmation that Italy is violating human rights, a sort of public moral condemnation. This is the softest way in which on the name of, in the name of human rights we can interfere in uh, internal affairs of a state but there are more serious forms of interference of course economic sanctions up to military interventions I mean famously uh, liberal thinkers today believe that there are two reasons two cases in which war is legitimate one case is quite straightforward defense self-defense, if someone attacks you, uh, you have a right to defend yourself. The other case is human rights protections. So, in the sort of dominant political culture, cultures of our days, uh, these are the two cases in which a state is legitimate or uh, an alliance of states is legitimate in uh, waging war. One is self-defense, and that's not controversial unless you are a hardcore pacifist. Uh, the other one is in order to protect the human rights of certain individuals that are put at risk by the actions or failures to act on the part of the government under which these individuals live. Okay? So, um, The 
philosophy of human rights tries to, um, in a certain sense, shed light on uh, questions such as existence, nature, justification, of a subject that has become of certain political consequence, so to speak. I mean, we are, we are not talking about norms that have no impact in, uh, in the international political uh, scene. I mean, don't get confused. Many people think, oh yeah, human rights, everybody talks about human rights, but then we all know that there are violations of human rights all over the place, all the time. Yeah. That is certainly true, but at the same time, they exist as norms of uh, political decency that at least may be used by interested uh, actors in the international community to justify the use of force. Um, I mean, human rights, for example, determine whether you can be part uh, of uh, an international organization. So think about the case of Turkey and the European Union. The reason why Turkey is not going to make it into the European Union, assuming this is still something desirable, which I think it is, of course, uh, especially from the perspective of Turkey, as it is today, um, well, if you keep on, you know, firing academics that are not in line with what the government says, say, if you keep on putting in prisons political opponents, if you keep on violating basic human rights the way Turkey does, there are political consequences for that. And one of which is that their dream to be part of the European Union is not going to happen. It's, it's never going to become a reality. So, I am inviting you not to uh, not to uh, make the mistake of conflating the issue about the less than ideal level of human rights respect across the world on the one hand and uh, to jump from this point which is true to the not true false conclusion that human rights do not mean anything for the international uh, politics which is certainly tr not true. So, um, okay, so that's the very broad uh, introduction to uh, what we will be doing uh, in this course. Let me say something more specific about the general idea of human rights. Uh, what human rights do we find in the most authoritative documents of human rights? How can we group them, organize them, have a better sense of, of what we find in these documents. Well, Nikhil distinguishes, and I think it's a useful distinction, six families of human rights within the Universal Declaration. One uh, is the family of security rights, so protection of people against crimes such as murder, massacre, torture, rape. Again, remember, a lot of the difference is made by who is responsible of this kind of uh, uh, crimes. If you, you know, walk uh, on the street of Florianopolis, I know it's not going to happen because Florianopolis is, is a very calm and uh, secure place, but, and, you know, a criminal shoots you or robs you, and in the, in the, in the uh, during the robbery, he is, you know, he kills you or something like that. That that doesn't mean that uh, you have been uh, a victim of a human rights violation. That's a just a, just, a, just a crime, a penal crime that is taken care of by the national law. Uh, again, it's very different if the police shoots at you because you didn't stop, uh, I don't know, at a, at a check on the streets. That's, that's clearly m more likely a human rights violation. But, of course, the first family of human rights that we find are concerned with protecting you uh, from crimes such as murder, massacre, torture, rape, primarily 
uh, committed by public officials. Okay? Then there is the family of the so-called due process rights. So these are human rights that protect against abuses of the legal system such as imprisonment without trial, secret trials and excessive punishment. And by excessive, of course, uh, we mean uh, also cruel punishment, uh, uh, degrading punishment, um, all the things that Cesare Beccaria was concerned about. Then there is the family of liberty rights. I mean, you can, I invite you to have a look at the Universal Declaration. We are talking about a you know, few, few dozens of, of rights, something that you can read in 15 minutes. Um, in the family of liberty rights, uh, not surprisingly, uh, we find uh, protections in areas such as belief, expression, uh, freedom of belief, freedom of expression, freedom of association, freedom of assembly, movement, so the whole family of uh, civic rights. Then we have political rights that are to be distinguished in this case from civic rights because as I already anticipated, while there is widespread agreement even among minimalists about human rights, that civic rights are human rights, so it's very hard to find someone who says that if a government does not allow you to protest, uh, this is not a human right violation. Uh, but Political rights are usually considered as those rights that entitle you to participate in the shaping of political decisions in your society and most of the time they are considered as those rights that entitles you on an equal footing with all the other citizens to participate in this process. Now, these are much more contested rights in the sense that way less theoreticians of human rights believe that in the case in which your government does not let you participate on an equal footing at least in the shaping of political decision, for example, denies you the right to vote, that is by itself a human right violation. Of course, in the Universal Declaration we have political rights. So, it's not the case. I'm not suggesting that the official documents are silent about political rights, not at all. Uh, but not accidentally, even in the Universal Declaration that is often pretty much more ambitious than other documents, uh, you don't find, for example, a human right to democracy. That it's never written that, you know, unless you live under a democratic government, your human rights are violated. There is something that alludes to that uh, effect in the sense that you are entitled to participate to the shaping of political decision, you have a human right to be under a just government, but uh, I don't think it's an accident that the, that the Universal Declaration remains non-committal to the specific form that this government has to make. So for example, a benevolent oligarchy, so imagine that you live under, you know, uh, a government restricted to only few people in the society, but that they, you know, uh, pass good laws and uh, make sure that the well-being and the basic rights, civil rights, for example, security rights of citizens are protected and respected, then uh, possibly that government uh, is not violating what the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is talking about in terms of uh, political rights. Okay. Then we have equality rights and that gets tricky in, with reference to what I just said that guarantee equal citizenship, equality before the law, no discrimination uh, and then we have social and welfare rights that require provision of education to all children, protection against severe poverty and starvation. So, for example, one typical mistake is to believe that human rights are 
non-committal about social and uh, economic um, issues. That is clearly not the case. Even in 1948, uh, the founding fathers of the human rights um, culture thought that human rights should not be confined to negative rights, if you know this expression, you know, the, the idea of uh, protecting from interference but uh, remaining non-committal about positive rights, so the things that the government should do to help you uh, avoid uh, uh, forms of uh, social economic marginalization. And finally, I'd like to mention, present always in uh, uh, the 1948 Universal Declaration, group rights. Uh, it, group rights are not an invention of uh, the 60s or the 70s. I mean, uh, a, a, an attention towards the rights of minorities already there in 1948. Um, and, uh, I mean, group rights include protections of ethnic groups against genocide and the ownership by countries of their national territories and resources. So, I mean, the Universal Declaration makes a gesture towards these protections of minorities, although it's clearly the case that the protection of group rights has become more and more, uh, uh, after the Declaration, uh, uh, an issue for subsequent documents. Okay, so having distinguished these six families of human rights that we find in the most important documents of the human rights culture, the 1948 Universal Declaration, we, can, we are already in the position to avoid uh, common uh, mistakes in conceiving uh, of human rights, one of which I have already mentioned the idea that human rights are only negative rights. That's just a mistake. It's not true. Um, um, another typical uh, mistake that people make in thinking of human rights is that human rights as we know them are inalienable. So they cannot be alienated, they cannot be lost by uh, individuals. I mean, that's questionable because, of course, your uh, human right to free movement is going to be uh, uh, suspended, at least, if you commit a crime and you go to jail. So it depends how you conceive of it, but uh, it's not the case that my uh, right to whatever political rights, for example, I have is inalienable because sometimes criminals are not allowed to vote and with, you know, uh, uh, legitimate grounds or they are simply not given the same amount of freedom of movement that free and uh, people who have not committed crimes are given. So it's not necessarily the case human rights are inalienable as one often hear. Now, another very interesting mistake that is usually made in conceiving of human rights is that human rights, you will hear that all the time, define where legitimate toleration of other countries ends. So one of the main functions of human rights, as I was perhaps also suggesting before, I didn't mean to put it in these terms, I don't think I put it in these terms, is that they really define the limits of legitimacy of national governments. When is it the case that a government is legitimate from the perspective of the international community? Well, to the extent in which it doesn't violate human rights. This approach to really make identical the issue of what counts as a human right with the issue of what counts as a legitimate interference against uh, a national government when it is in the case that the international community is legitimate in interfering 
with another government is a sort of poison gift that we receive from John Rawls uh, and his theorization of human rights. Um, because Rawls uh, thought precisely in these terms that you know, whatever we think of human rights, whatever we believe human rights are, is going to define the limits of tolerance towards national governments. So, not accidentally, Rawls was very careful to limit the list of human rights to very few things, because of course you don't want to interfere uh, and, you know, uh, wage war against the country if uh, it doesn't provide for everybody free holiday with pay, just to give you the, you know, the example I was mentioning before. Uh, or many few people believe that even if Italy uh, is not up to the international standards uh, because there are too many people in prison and prisons are uh, not um, uh, enough spacious to occupy in a decent way all the prisoners that Italy has. Uh, for that reason, uh, other countries or the international community or the, I don't know, the United Nations or whatever has the right to wage war against Italy for that human rights violation or even to, give, you know, to impose sanctions against Italy. So, to avoid this counterintuitive uh, consequence, this counterintuitive result, Rawls strips down the list of human rights that are many and covers a lot of areas to only four human rights, the right to life, including the means of subsistence and security, the right to liberty, freedoms of slavery, serfdom, forced occupation, uh, and a sufficient measure of liberty of conscience, of course for the sake of freedom of religion, that Rawls was very preoccupied about, um, the right to property, uh, and to formal equality, uh, meaning by formal equality to be uh, equal before the law. Now this is a very reduced, stripped down, shortened list of human rights. For example, the first thing that one notices is that there is no mentioning of political rights here. And in fact, when I was uh, anticipating that many philosophers believe that political rights should not be made part of human rights, I had in mind uh, mainly Rawls and his followers. Uh, so, what I'm trying to suggest is that this um, tendency to reduce the list of human rights to very few and basic things, these four rights that I just listed, is a consequence of a conceptual mistake uh, that is made um, by Rawls and his followers to think that human rights are all about defining the limits of acceptability of national governments. If you make this assumption, then you are kind of forced to reduce the list of human rights, because otherwise you end up saying that, for example, a country that is not democratic might be interfered precisely for that reason, uh, uh, or other counterintuitive consequences. But Nigel thinks, and I fully agree with him on this, that uh, we should not identify the limits of uh, political acceptability for national governments with human rights. Certainly human rights play a role in uh, uh, identifying these limits, but they should not be reduced to that function. This means 
that we can have a richer list of human rights and believe that only some of them are those that, if violated, trigger uh, intervention by the international community. So, you can have uh, a sort of core uh, list of human rights that you decide are those that, if violated, the international community is legitimate in interfering with the national government that committed those severe violations, uh, and at the same time have other human rights that you still consider as human rights that trigger either less serious forms of intervention or no intervention at all. So the intuitive idea here is that it's a mistake to identify human rights with the limits of national government, the, uh, the legitimacy of national governments, uh, and that human rights can still perform this function of determining what counts as legitimate national government uh, without being reduced to that function. Um, in fact, this is exactly what happens uh, today uh, with the famous uh, document that you might have heard already called the responsibility to protect that is uh, by now the standard um, document to determine when it is